your hosts have earned a reputation as fierce and effective advocates inside and outside of the courtroom. Both partners are experienced trial attorneys who have been board certified in family law by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. Thanks for tuning in to For Better, Worse, or Divorce podcast, where we provide you tips and insight how to navigate divorce and child custody situations. I'm Jake Gilbreth. I'm with my partner, Brian Walters, uh, and we are going to celebrate our 70th episode, which is shocking to believe. Uh, and we thought we'd recap a few of our last several episodes, answer some listener questions, as well as give some insight on what's to come. So... Um, Let's talk about favorite episodes, actually. Uh, and those of those uh, listening that know us will probably guess which ones are our favorite episodes. But, Brian, let's start with you. What's been your favorite episode uh, so far? Well, I guess, first of all, before we even do that, is talk to me about the, the pocket. We started this during COVID, didn't we? Um, I think sort of towards the start. I think so. It was kind of like an, right, an easy way to, to, you know, put some information on the website and, you um, you know, and talk about it. And we just, I, you know, you and I both listen to podcasts on, out there. And so we thought, well, you know, maybe there'll be two or three people that are interested in what we're talking about. Maybe not. And, um, and it's really taken off. It's been, um, it's been great. I, I've been surprised. I, I repeatedly hear about it on when I do intake calls of, hey, I listen to you guys talk about this or that. And um, I've, I think probably now that we're at 70, I'm not going to hear this very often, but I remember earlier on, I remember a couple of people said, like, I've listened to all your podcasts, which was startling to me. But um, yeah, uh, it's it's been great. And it's, of course, easy. And, and I learn things sometimes. I did one the other day about grandparent rights and access, kind of third party access and stuff with our partner up in Dallas. And um, I mean, I've learned several things that I'm now applying to a, a new case I have on the point. So it's helpful for me even. Well, I, I tell people this is one thing that I really like about our podcast. It really is unscripted, which you can tell sometimes, uh, but it really is unscripted. It's just, hey, there's no rehearsal or anything. This is just you and I talking or us and a guest talking. Um, I mean, I think it's a testament that I, I don't know what this says about us, um, our psychological functioning, but but I really enjoy what I do. I know, Brian, you really enjoy what you do. Um, we enjoy talking to other people about what we do, and so it's 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 actually a lot of fun um, doing, doing for us. So I guess, so now back to, to, to the question, which is um, out of those 70, what co- sort of comes out uh, to you, Brian, is sort of what your favorite thing that we've talked about? We're kind of related. I have two of them that come to mind. I mean, the, um, the one we talked about, uh, about our intake system, which I think is episode 58. Um, we've worked really hard on that. Um, we've got a really wonderful staff that handles that initially. And um, you and I, you know, constantly juggling around our our day to make make it make ourselves available. Between you know, right before this podcast started, I was scheduling uh, intake for this afternoon with the client in Washington D.C. and trying to find a time. And you know, that's just typical uh, of us. So yeah, you know, we're really. I think you and I are both really proud of that system we built to make it really easy for folks to talk to us when they need us. And um, and then my personal favorite, just the title is, can I fire my attorney? Which I think we meant to apply to another attorney other than us, but I guess it applies to us too. That doesn't, fortunately doesn't happen very often with us, with our clients. But um, I don't know, is it a third of our caseload is probably for the second lawyer where people have said, whoops, I made a mistake in my first hire and I need to upgrade. Um, so, and I get that all the time when I talk to people, I'm like, well, gosh, you know, they're they're kind of embarrassed like, you know, maybe they're upset with their former lawyer, but they're usually just disappointed. And they're like, can I do that? Will the judge think there's something wrong with me? You know, who's going to, I don't know if I want to break the bad news to them. So we go over all that stuff in there. And um, that was an interest, interesting one, because I think we also got into some tangents about how how bad some of these other lawyers are, which is not surprising knowing uh, when you look at the surveys of people, Americans' views of lawyers is not, not real high. So uh, anyway, what about you? What's your uh, favorite one or ones that come to mind? Well, first of all, I love yours. Um, and it also, like you said, it gave us an opportunity um, to talk about my favorite topic, which is communication. Uh, and those who listen to the podcast know somehow, some way I'm going to weave that into probably 70% of the episodes of how bad other people are at communication and how much we stress it, the communication between the client and the attorney. 
but I also love those episodes that you said, Brian, so much because I, I like that we're very open about how we do things, right? We want our clients to know how we do things. We want um, our peers to know how we do things. We want our competitors to know how we do things. I mean, it's no big secret um, out there of, of how much work we've done um, making the client experience better. Um, you know, frankly, with I hope that people replicate it because I think people deserve a better service. Now, shockingly, people don't. Um, but but I like that we have it. I really enjoy those episodes. I think one of them, you took the lead, Brian, with Katie, um, one we did together. And I just really, I mean, I listen to our own podcast. I don't know what that says about me, but I listen to our own podcast and I really enjoy listening to those. So my personal favorites um, was kind of a recent one we did with Keith Maples. And for those who haven't heard, Keith is a phenomenal lawyer um, in the Austin area. He mediates a lot. He litigates a lot. Uh, he's somebody I've looked up to since, I, you know, I think I probably knew his name in law school. Um, but even outside of law school, once I graduated from law school, you know, see his name all the time. And he's just a great lawyer. Um, and he and I both have a passion for representing families for kids with special needs. He and I are both very open about um, our own, uh, both of us have a son that are on uh, on the autism spectrum, and we're both very open about that and talk about that. Uh, and we did a series on representing families with kids and the special needs, and that was that meant a lot to me. That that you know that Keith did that with me as somebody who I really look up to, and that we were able to get that information um, out to people. So that's probably my what comes to mind as my favorite. Um, and you know, it also says something, I guess, just as an aside about the community of lawyers that we have. Um, you know, there's, we talk about the problems out there in the legal community, but there's also a lot of positive and Keith is somebody, you know, who's a competitor. Keith is somebody who we've tried cases against each other. We've tried contentious cases against each other, uh, multi-day trials. We've had jury trials against one another. And at the end of the day, we respect one another and we work together and, I preach this till I'm blue in the face. It's hard to, re and I understand why it's hard to believe sometimes for clients, but it's actually better for the clients when there's a mutual respect and we work together, even if we have opposing goals, um, that we can sort of do that. So that meant a lot to me. And then I guess another episode was, I really enjoyed, really yours, Brian, um, uh, but our, our personal stories when we sort of did a meet Brian and meet Jake episode um, I enjoy that because uh, I didn't know everything about your, I mean, you and I have talked a little bit about our backgrounds over the years, but I didn't know everything about your background. Um, so I enjoyed that part of that episode. But I also really enjoyed the fact that, you know, the way that you and I see the practice of law and particularly being family lawyers is that I think our personal lives are something that we are and should be open sharing. I mean, people come into our office and I think they care that you and I both went to UT, UT Law. Um, they care that we're both board certified. They obviously care that we're very good at what we do, and we hire lawyers who are very good at what they do. But it's also important to remember that we're human. Um, and so many lawyers kind of shield that part of their lives, I think. Um, they're not open, sort of talking about their own personal experiences and where they come from. And that can, you know, our clients are coming to us in a really difficult time, and that can be... Um, I guess something that really means a lot to, to our clients if we're opening up about kind of my, our own personal experience. Everybody's life is different, but just here's where I'm coming from. Um, I talk to people about my own divorce or my own divorce decree. Um, you know, I talk to people about being remarried and um, that my wife runs the business and, and how much that means to me. It's just I talk about my kids and I talk about my son who's on the autism spectrum. It's just I, I want my clients knowing about me just like I'm going to know about them. And I want to be partners with somebody I, I know about his his life and his family and our families and our wives are close and our kids are close and everything and that that just means a lot to me of sort of how we how we sort of approach um, approach business and the practice of law. So let's talk about sort of the recent topics. So if you're you know you're more than welcome to listen to episode one all the way to episode seventy. I think the uh, production quality has probably gotten better over, over the over the years. I guess it has been years. Um, but, you know, it's always the same It's me and Brian talking or to a guest about, you know, just information that we think people would be interested in. Some recent topics, um, you know, we've talked about grandparents' rights recently. Brian, like you talked about with uh, one of our partners, Ryan, uh, up in the Dallas office. 
geographic restrictions, obviously always a very important topic in child custody litigation. Tax season, we just recently recorded something on that. Informal law marriages, uh, in, informal marriages. Uh, we have a recent episode on that, which you and I really enjoy that because those get litigated a lot and we get hired a lot on those issues. And then, of course, we recently had a series on businesses, shared businesses, how to deal with businesses in a divorce. Um, and so those are all kind of recent episodes of people kind of scrolling, um, you know, kind of more current episodes uh, of what we've been talking about uh, lately. But um, let's talk about some questions that we've gotten from listeners. We want to address that on our 70th episode, and then we'll sort of transition to what's, what's to come on the podcast for those who are interested. So let me just throw some questions at you, Brian. We'll go through those, and then we'll wrap up with plans for the futures. But somebody wrote in and said, my spouse said she wants to file a collaborative divorce. What does that mean, and do you take these types of cases? Um, so there's a, a question we get pretty commonly, Brian. So tell me about... Uh, what's your take when somebody comes in and uses the phrase collaborative? Yeah, divorce. absolutely. In fact, I dealt with that twice this weekend on two on a new case and then on a on a sort of new case. Um, so there's really two paths you can go down. Um, you can go down the collaborative divorce path. Um, that is a very specific set of rules and um, processes. It's relatively new in Texas. Um, it didn't even exist when I started practicing. Um, and I would say that it's less than 1% of all cases are, are formally doing that. So in that system, you have to tell the court that's what we're going to do. And um, you basically agree to keep it out of court and, and to try to reach an agreement. But of course, if it fails, you'll be right back in court. The, the problem with it is, is um, and the reason we don't see it, people using it that often, is that I think there are two problems. One is that there's almost always someone more in a hurry to get divorced than the other. And so for the person in a hurry, this is not a good system because the only way to really force the case along if the other party doesn't want to get divorced or isn't in a hurry to get divorced is to set it for court, and you can't do that in a collaborative divorce. The other problem is, is that if, if it fails, you have to get new lawyers. And that, that's a problem because that's expensive, first of all. Um, and I think that can cause some incentive issues with lawyers, too, um, maybe wanting to keep it in the collaborative uh, box longer than it should be in certain cases to keep the case. So um, that's why I think it's pretty rarely done. Um, I mean, we can do them if necessary, uh, but I have very few people that once they're explained the, the options actually want to formally do that. What I find much more common, and I'm sure you do too, is that people tell me like, look, I don't want to have a big fight. I'm, I'm sorry our marriage is coming to an end, or you could even do that you know, in a, in a non-marriage, but let's use that as an example. But I, I want you to work together with the other lawyer and you know, let's get ourselves divorced and let's not spend a bunch of money and tear each other's you know, apart. It just, I don't want to do that, right? And that's collaborative, I guess, informally, right? That we're, we're going to try to work it out with the other side versus, um, you know, immediately going for the juggler, I guess, is what is the way I'd put that. Is that sort of how you see it? Or do you have a little different experience with it? No, that's, that's kind of my experience. I mean, I get the concept. I'm pretty open about my skepticism towards the process. Um, and I always remind people just because we're not doing the because collaborative has a legal meaning to it. There's a section of the family code for collaborative divorce. Just because we're not in the collaborative process doesn't mean that we're not going to be cooperative. I have cases all the time where we don't never see the inside of a courtroom or virtual courtroom. Um, and we, we kind of proceed logically, but it's not in this collaborative system because it is a system where, I mean, frankly, I sort of describe it to clients as where we sit around and talk about thinking about what the agenda is going to be for the next meeting where we determine the schedule for the final meeting. I mean, it's just a lot of, I think, stuff that's not necessary and bogs down the process. And like I said, it's, it, it causes an incentive to sort of play the system. I mean, if I'm the collaborative system, say I have the wife and the husband said, we want two years of your business's tax returns and three years of uh, banking statements from your business. <clears throat> totally normal request. And he goes, no, I'm not going to do that. And you're, if you're in the regular process, you know, which is technically the litigation process, I go, well, yeah, you are going to give that to me. And here's your motion to come. Here's your discovery request. And here's your motion to compel. I'll see you in court in three days. Um, and if you're in the collaborative process, it's, 
please give it to me. Pretty please. No, seriously, please give it to me. And then if they won't, you got to bust out and go all the way to the beginning and fire your lawyers. It's just, I get the concept. We could do a whole podcast episode of, I think, problems. But again, it doesn't mean just because you say no to the collaborative process. The, the main takeaway is just because you're not doing this formal legal process, the collaborative process, that doesn't mean you're going down the courthouse and fighting like cats and dogs. It just means that you're not in that system, which I don't think is a very good system. I get the concept. I don't think it's a very good system. I agree. It reminds me of um, Austin, Travis County back. I think it was before I started practice. I think it was in the 80s. They, they tried to implement the, the, I think it was called the Santa Fe system, like Santa Fe, New Mexico, I guess. That's where they did it. And they were basically tried to make the whole litigation system for family law like that. Made it, made it very, very difficult to get into court. And, and as you well know, that, that doesn't exist in Travis County anymore. That, that went the way of the dinosaurs pretty quickly. So, um, well, here's a question, another one. I'll, I'll ask it and you can give an answer. Um, and I've seen variations on this. Um, but it's, let's say um, a person got married in 1995, so you know, quite a while ago. Uh, we were never legally divorced, um, but they hadn't. But they haven't seen their husband in many years, and have no idea where the husband is. Um, I'm going to assume there's no children either. Um, I'm ready to get remarried. Um, so, how would the divorce work um, in that case? Yeah, it's a relatively straightforward answer. I'm going to try to use the terminology right because I haven't done one of these in a while. But it's in the. Um, it, it's you. You can. You still have to file for divorce. You, and you still have to notify and serve the other side of the divorce petition. Any lawsuit, the other side has to be served or file a waiver. If you can't find them, you have no idea where they are, then there is a process um, where you essentially serve them by, uh, if there's no kids, it'd be by posting. Um, and you have to have a motion and a court order for it um, and be able to prove to the court that I really have no idea what this person is and I can't locate them. Um, and then essentially they give notice of the divorce petition um, basically by posting it, um, uh, posting in the, uh, at the courthouse actually, um, as I believe how it's formally done. And that gives the other side, that's actually the citation, the return of citation from the point of posting. And then you can sort of proceed on it. But it, I've seen courts where there's kids involved, um, you have to do it by publication. There has to be an amicus to try to locate the other side. It can get, it, sometimes I see courts want, uh, appointed, um, an amicus, even when there's not kids, just because they, they want that comfort level, a third party trying to locate the individual. But the long and short of it is there is a way to move forward. It's, it's really easy to mess up, um, and it's tedious, uh, but it can be done. Then here's a, um, just sort of rattling leads off. Uh, there's a, this kind of common one, Brian, um, it's pretty straightforward answer, but a common one. If I have proof my spouse cheat on me, will this help me in court? I think it's the way the listener phrased it. Yeah, and I, I think we did a, a podcast a while ago where we dealt with this issue in, in some more detail. But broadly speaking, um, y yes, um, so in two ways, I think. Um, there is specific uh, basis for getting divorced in Texas, which is adultery. So that would be, that would allow that. And, and if that's true, the court can, when it's dividing property, take that into consideration and, and the division of the property and basically punish someone for that behavior by giving more money to the other side. Um, th that doesn't always happen. There's no guideline about, hey, it's an extra, you know, 5% or 10% or, or, you know, $10,000 or anything like that. So it's very specific as to the situation. Um, I think it, it, you know, that that's a complex question which you'd want to talk to your lawyer about, about your specific situation. Um, as a, on a custody case, I used to say that didn't matter. I, I actually, I've modified that a little bit to think, I think it depends a little bit on some of the details around it. If if your spouse has cheated on you and introduced their, you know, their boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever uh, as, you know, mommy or daddy, um, you know, uh, that's not going to look good in a custody battle. Um, and in fact, the court could take some pretty strong actions along those lines. Um, generally, that's not what happens, but it could be. So uh, the short answer is, yeah, it, it could help you in court, it, but exactly what that's going to look like is a, is a very complicated answer. It's going to depend a lot on the specifics, which court you're in, which judge you're in front of, um, and overall facts in the case. Yeah, it's long, it, it depends, but it's, it's, it, it most likely is going to play one way or the other. All right, so here's a question for you. The majority of my income is determined in commissions 
and an annual bonus, um, how would my child support payments be determined if I don't have a set salary? Common question. Court's going to look at, yeah, it's very common. Courts are historically going to look at, just look at a couple years, two or three years worth of tax returns, you know, what um, what has been the case, and they're going to expect that to continue unless there's a really good explanation why that's not going to continue. Um, and so we a lot of times we're looking respectively for prior years and saying child support payments. But if you have a situation where somebody's taking a new job or maybe gotten a promotion or commissions are going up and stuff, then there may be more on either side. There may be exploration into what we actually think the obligor's income is going to be. Maybe we're looking at a contract he or she signed, what the how the company's doing. Could be even deposing people in some situations from the company, um, because the court's going to try to get it right. But they're going to look historically most of the time. Um, and then if you want the court to look at something other than history, then you're probably going to be doing some additional discovery uh, on that. I was just going to add on, on Saturday morning, I, I just had this exact discussion, and it was not so much the amount of child support. The question was, because they were very much on commission, you know, what about the payment schedule? Could it follow their cash flow? And I know the short, short story, no. Um, it's going to be a set amount on the first day of each month, um, is, and, and you're, going, you're going to have to manage your cash flow. The, the court's not going to do it for you, essentially. So um, go ahead. Yeah, and then this last one, um, somebody asked that they're currently pregnant with their first child. Should I wait till after the baby is born to file for divorce? No, I, there's no legal reason to. Um, and, and in fact, in theory, the court could grant a divorce even if you're pregnant. But as a practical matter, they won't. They're going to wait until the child's alive birth um, and then go from there. There may you know, may even be a DNA test if, if there's any question about that. In fact, that's probably not a bad, a bad policy in general in that situation. So... Um, no, it, it doesn't affect it. It may, it, it shouldn't affect when you file. It may affect when the divorce is finalized though. So that's, that's the difference. It could delay it a bit. Um, so there we go. Yeah, I think that's all right. And if you're the parent, you know, the non-pregnant, uh, parent, um, you may, frankly, I mean, obviously everything's a kind of a personal decision and there's emotional things about the filing of divorce or timing of it. Um, but you know, sometimes it's better to have something on file so you can get to court sooner. If, if it's just the other side's not gonna let you see the baby and you're missing out on, it's just every situation's different. So it's, you need to think about it both ways. Um, but yeah, those are some, some common questions or some current questions that we've gotten. Uh, so coming up on the podcast, what we have uh, planned is we're going to have, of course, continue to have guests on. I think we're going to have some experts and other family law attorneys from around the country, actually, to discuss family law trends. I think we have some immigration issues and interstate issues coming up. Uh, I think we're going to do a series on stock, retirements, and investments in a divorce. And, you know, one of our favorite topics is jury trials. We're going to actually do a whole series on jury trials. Um, so that will be coming up. We're going to continue to do this. We are really, really appreciative of all the support that we've done, that we've gotten kind of over the years in this podcast. Uh, we really enjoy it, so we love hearing uh, when other people enjoy it. So if you like what you've heard today, obviously uh, do us a favor and leave a review. Any feedback, good, negative, in between, uh, it always helps us with the podcast. And so feel free to reach out to us at podcast at waltersgilbreth.com. You can go to our website at waltersgilbreth.com. Um, I've really enjoyed this. And so signing off for this episode, I'm Jake Gilbreth. I'm here with Brian Walters. And thank you all for listening. For information about the topics covered in today's episode and more, you can visit our website at waltersgilbreth.com. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of For Better, Worse, or Divorce, where we post new episodes every first and third Wednesday. Do you have a topic you want discussed or a question for our hosts? Email us at podcast at waltersgilbreth.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time.